Um, okay. Uh, so today we're going to start uh, with probability on discrete random variables. And uh, before we do that, as usual, uh, I'm an employee of Columbia University. I'm also a founder of Stan Group, which provides consulting services, et cetera, to business using Stan. According to Columbia policy, those two things together requires this to be disclosed in any presentations. Uh, so the goal for today, uh, we're going to talk about bowling because a single frame of bowling is about the simplest non-trivial example uh, that I can give you that's sufficient to illustrate all the relevant concepts of probability that we need to know uh, when there's a finite number of elements. Is there a way to make the projector any more clearer? Um, mm, probably, but I don't know what it is. So if you want to scoot down closer, maybe uh, this is full screen. Is it, is it, uh, it will be later after class. Um, <clears throat> so sufficient to illustrate the relevant concepts of probability, finite number of elements. Questions such as like, what's the probability of knocking down three pins on the first roll of a frame of bowling given that four pins were knocked down on the second roll? Or what is the correlation between two rolls in the same frame of bowling, etc.? You probably have no idea uh, how you go about answering questions like that for now, but by the end of the class, uh, you will. The other thing uh, that I want to emphasize is Piazza. Um, everyone should log in. I know if you haven't even logged in once yet, um, and start posting questions, ideally also answers, uh, whether that's about the video, uh, the reading, <clears throat> the class, etc. There's not going to be time to get to everyone's questions, you know, during the lecture period. Uh, so we've got to have, you know, enough of a discussion uh, online. Remember that one sixth of your grade depends on having uh, good course participation. And if you're not registered for the class on CourseWorks yet, but you think you're going to, um, you can log in directly at the Piazza website uh, through this link. You don't have to be registered on CourseWorks to do that. So uh, in order to start talking about probability, we have to have some definitions. The first is a set, which is a collection of elements. And those elements can either be uh, simple isolated elements or they could be intervals. So an example of a set that we use a lot of times is the real numbers um, indicated by this sort of hollow R. Those are numbers that have uh, decimal places with you know, non-zero uh, things to the right of the decimal place. A subset of the set of real numbers is integers, which are typically denoted by the hollow Z. And those are real numbers where all the decimal places have been uh, zeroed out. We can exclude some numbers from a set. So sometimes we'll talk about the set of all non-negative numbers. Um, but sets don't have to be intervals. In this case, today, we're really going to be focused on a subset of Z um, the number of pins you can knock down when bowling. So after we've defined a set, we can define what it means to be a random variable. So a random variable is a function, so we first need to define that. A function is some rule that uniquely maps from, one, uh, from each element of some input set to some element of the output set, and it needs to be unique. Uh, a unique mapping. A random variable is a special type of function. It's a function from what's known as the sample space to some subset of the real numbers with a probability-based rule. So what's the sample space? Uh, the sample space is the set of all possible outcomes for a random variable. And so we're going to be assigning probabilities of each element of a set omega, the sample space happening, according to some uh, probability. So to take an example, let's say you do one roll of a six-sided die. What is the sample space omega? The number of things that can happen, or the, the, all things that could happen. Six. Six, right. And those are what? The size of the die. Right. One, two, three, four, five, six. So, but it's important to not conflate the realization of a random variable like one roll 
of a die with the process that generates it or the function that generates it. So really we're talking about the function where you roll uh, a die here uh, in most cases. And there's a convention that goes back a long way, like uh, before there was proper typesetting, to use a capital letter to indicate a random variable, which is a function or a process, and a lowercase letter, you know, the, the same thing, but in lowercase, to indicate a realization of that process. So X would be, capital X would be like rolling the die, that's a function, and four would be a possible realization of that random process. And this is, you know, important to define random variables and sample spaces and things like that, because, you know, when we get to Stan, if not before, but Stan definitely will require you to specify what is the sample space? What are the possible things that this variable could be in order for it to proceed? So that's the first and most basic thing that you as a human can convey about uh, some random variable that you don't know exactly what it is. Well, what are the values that it possibly could be? Could it be all numbers, only positive numbers, only integers, um, et cetera? Just a little bit of notation. Um, you can refer back to this, the sort of upside down U symbol uh, can be read as and, whereas the vertical bar can be read as given, and the regular U-shaped uh, symbol can be read as or. So we can put like A operator B, and that operator can be the upside down, the regular U, or the vertical bar to indicate given. We can negate any uh, statement, logical statement with exclamation point. Uh, this sort of C looking thing, uh, <coughs> A uh, cup omega means that the set A is some subset uh, of the set omega that has to be at least as large. The Ghostbuster symbol uh, is the empty set. <coughs> it contains no elements. And this upside down A thing can be read as for all. So the thing at the bottom means for all A greater than B. Okay, so you may need to refer back to that, but it'll be in the on coursework later this afternoon. So the rules of probability, uh, Bayesians tend to have like very deep uh, axioms and justifications for these rules. I'm just going to state them as facts without trying to justify them more deeply. The probability of something in set A happening has to be between zero and one inclusive. And the probability is one if the input set is the whole sample space. So the sample space has to be exhaustive of all things that can happen, in which case you're guaranteed that something in the sample space has to occur. It occurs with probability one. Uh, if you're more familiar uh, with medical research or horse racing, uh, you may have heard uh, uncertainty be quantified in terms of odds. Odds are a one-to-one -one function of probability, namely the odds of A are the probability of A divided by the probability that A does not occur, which is equal to one minus the probability of A. Uh, there's two extremely important rules of probability. One is the general addition rule, um, and this reads as the probability that something in set A happens or something in set B happens is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability that something from set A happens and something from set B happens. So if we take the two events like what's the probability the temperature is greater than 50 degrees and what's the probability that it rains uh, the probability that it is greater than 50 degrees or that it rains is equal to the sum of the two probabilities separate minus the probability that it's greater than 50 degrees and it rains. Without that third term there uh, subtracting off the probability that both things occur, uh, you could, without that, you could get the result of the probability of A or B is greater than one and that's impossible. So by subtracting off the probability that both things occur,
that is going to ensure the probability of A or B is less than or equal to one. Questions about the general addition rule or sets or anything like that? Right, the third term could be zero. That's legal. Um, okay, and then we have the general multiplication rule, which says the probability of something in set A occurring and the probability of something in set B occurring is equal to the probability that something in B happens multiplied by the probability that something in A happens given that that thing from set B has happened. This can also be written as the probability of something from set A happening multiplied by the probability of something from set B happening given that that thing in A has happened. Uh, so this is known as the multiplication rule and probability of A vertical bar B again reads the probability of something from A occurring given that the something from set B has occurred. And often A and B are just single element sets. So they can be multi-element sets, but in which case you just read it as, you know, the probability it's something from set A occurs. So those two rules are probably the, you know, the most two important theorems uh, in probability in terms of the foundations for everything else. Moreover, they lead themselves to a definition of an extremely important concept, which is to say that A and B are independent of each other, if and only if, so that's what if with two Fs means, A and B are independent if and only if the probability of A and B occurring is equal to the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B um, and that's a simplification of the general multiplication rule. So in order for that to occur, the probability of A given B needs to just simplify to the probability of A and the same thing for the probability of B given A. So basically speaking, independence entails that the fact that B has occurred tells you nothing about event A. So you know, let's say it's uh, the two events are, you know, the probability that it's greater, the temperature is greater than 50 degrees and the day of the week is a Thursday. So if I tell you today is Thursday, does that tell you anything at all about the probability that the temperature is greater than 50 degrees? No, uh, Thursday is just an arbitrary, you know, designation. So in that case, the temperature and the day of the week could plausibly be seen as independent events. All right? Questions about that? All right. Okay, so each frame in bowling has 10 pins, so we'll designate that with a little n. You get two frame, uh, two rolls per frame to knock down pins. And we're just gonna think about one frame in isolation, not the whole sequence of frames in a, in a game of bowling. Um, so just for practice, on your first roll of a frame of bowling, what is the sample space? Uh, what is the sample space in this case? Zero to 10. Uh, zero to 10, correct. Any integer between 0 and 10 is the number of pins that could get knocked down on the first roll of a frame of bowling. You with me on that? Everyone familiar with bowling? It's not very complicated. All right. So people who study bowling uh, for a living have found that the probability that a good bowler uh, knocks down X out of N pins can be approximated by the function. So this is the probability of knocking down, you know, X equal one, X equal two, whatever pins, uh, is equal to a ratio of uh, Fibonacci numbers. So Fibonacci number, uh, the zeroth one is one, the first Fibonacci number is one, and then for all values of X greater than or equal to two, 
a Fibonacci number is defined as the sum of the previous two Fibonacci numbers. So the first 12 uh, Fibonacci numbers in the series are given here. And we can uh, construct a function that tells us, you know, the probability of knocking down X pins. It's the Xth Fibonacci number divided by the N plus two Fibonacci number. And then there's a minus one in the denominator there. So oftentimes when there's a lot of elements to the sample space, you know, in this case, we could just enumerate uh, 11 probabilities that are positive and add up to one. And that would be a valid uh, probability rule to define the random variable for rolling a bowling ball. But when there's a lot of elements in omega, we often specify a relatively concise function that has the properties of a valid probability rule, namely that, um, you know, they're non-negative numbers and the probability that something in the sample space occurs is one. And it can be shown that this uh, Fibonacci uh, way of defining the probability of knocking down X out of N pins is a valid uh, probability function. You can just trust me on that. So um, <clears throat> given that, how would we express the probability of obtaining a turkey, which is defined as three consecutive strikes where a strike is the event that you knock down all 10 pins with one roll. So I'll give you like five seconds to think about that. Okay, time's up. How would we express the probability of a turkey? You need another five seconds? I know you know. All right. So what, let me put it this way. What rule could we use to tell us the probability of a turkey? And there's only two rules that we've learned so far. Hmm? Okay. So it's plausible to assume these events are independent. That's good. And then what do we need to do at that point? Multiply. Multiply what? I'm thinking the probability of a strike times times the probability of a strike times or the probability of a strike raised to the power of three. All right. Does everybody see how we arrived at that? Uh, using the multiplication rule for the special case of independent events. So we multiply and if we multiply the same thing three times, that's just it raised to the power of three. Okay? Good. Uh, so like I said, uh, we're gonna be using R in this course. So I've just written a function called F, which returns a Fibonacci number, depending on what you input to it. This is just, you can look it up on Wikipedia, another way of computing Fibonacci numbers that you don't have to use the recursive definition to obtain it. But it, it tells us the Fibonacci number. And then in the middle, uh, I've defined another function named PR. And that uh, takes two arguments, X and N. By default, N is going to be 10. So if I don't specify the N, it's just going to use 10 as if, you know, we're talking about the first roll of a frame of bowling. <clears throat> and this function has the rule that it's going to return zero if x is greater than n so you can't knock down 17 pins in a roll of bowling so that's impossible so that gets probability zero otherwise it's the exit fibonacci number divided by the uh n plus two fibonacci number minus one in the denominator just the same way i put on the previous slide here with math all right so I have uh, a Fibonacci function. I have a probability function that returns the ratio of Fibonacci numbers with the minus one in the denominator there. Uh, and I have my sample space omega, which is all integers between zero and 10. Um, and I'm gonna put you know names on those. 
uh, so I can keep track of them. And, uh, you know, just to verify that this is right, if I put in omega into my probability function, it's going to tell me the probability of zero, the probability of one, etc. If I sum those all up, it comes out to one, which should be the case. Something from omega has to happen, guaranteed. Also, we can compute the probability of a turkey by inputting 10, raising that to the power of 3, comes out to be 0 0.056, which is relatively small, uh, even for a so-called uh, good bowler. This is not like professional bowler, but like someone who probably plays in a league or something like that. You know, three strikes in a row for a, a professional bowler would be higher than this. Okay? So we just got a few R functions of the little code here, um, and we can compute stuff. Okay. Uh, so the second role in a frame of bowling, let's say I told you, take it as given that you knock down seven pins on your first roll of a frame of bowling, how would we compute the probability that on your second roll you would knock down the three remaining pins? I'll give you five seconds to think about that. Maybe a little bit more than five seconds. Got to think fast. All right. How would we go about uh, calculating the probability of knocking down the remaining three pins if we knock down seven on the first roll? Yes. Right. So how would that relate to the denominator of this function here? Uh, yeah, that's right. Well, I, I think what you said is right. But so what would you put in the denominator? N would change to? Right. So we would evaluate in the numerator the third Fibonacci number, which is 2 and divide by the fifth Fibonacci number, which is uh, five, and then subtract one, and then calculate that, whatever number it would be, right? So what happens in the first roll affects the probability of everything that could happen in the second roll, inclusive of you know making something zero. So if you knock down seven, on the first roll, you can't knock down six on the second roll of the same frame of bowling. So the probability function for the second roll uh, is a function of what happens on the first roll. So n is going to depend on what x was from the first row. So in general, if we let x1 be the number of pins knocked down on the first roll, and x2 be the number of pins knocked down on the second roll, <clears throat> then we can express the probability of knocking down x2 pins on the second roll, given that we've knocked down x1 pins on the first roll, and we started with 10 pins available, as uh, what was said here. It's uh, the x2 Fibonacci number, divided by 10 minus, or the Fibonacci number at 10 minus x1 plus 2. So now n is equal to 10 minus x1. And then there's a negative 1 in the denominator. However, we have to multiply that whole thing by what's known as the indicator function. The indicator function, just like in R, uh, returns 1 if the thing is true and 0 if the thing is false. And that's what it uses uh, when doing multiplication on true falses. So this identity function here is 1 if x2 is less than or equal to 10 minus x1, and it's 0 if x2 is bigger than the number of pins available. So like I said, 
if you did seven on the first roll and six on the second, that has to come out as probability zero. And we enforce that by multiplying by the identity function, which would be zero in the case that X2 is greater than the number of available pairs. All right? Uh, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, no, the, the negative one is outside the Fibonacci, right? So it's it would be one divided by two minus one. Or eh, I said it wrong. Uh I may be off by one. Oh, no, 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 sorry. I start counting at zero. Okay. Uh, so that's zero. That's the first Fibonacci number. And then that's the, uh, what did you say, fourth? And so then subtract one. It would come out to one half, I think. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I'm Usually I start counting from one, but for today I'm starting counting at zero. Yeah. Uh, yes? Does the indicator function mean that the probability of zero is actually greater? Than like its representation in the set because everything higher than ten reverts back to zero. Uh, correct. Okay. And yeah. It's on purpose. No, that is on purpose. Yeah, just to have it be you know sensible for bowling. You could define other probability functions in other ways. Yeah. This isn't particularly realistic, right? In the sense that the probability function for the second frame is unlikely to be the same as the probability. First frame because assuming you hit something, you've opened up gaps. Uh, yeah, so this is not as detailed as what a bowling scholar would, you know, really get into. So if you have a seven ten split, so you knock down eight pins, but the remaining two are the two that are farthest apart, there's a very low probability that you knock that down, even though according to the function we specified, knocking down two out of two pins is pretty likely. So if they're two pins together, that kind of makes sense. But if they're two that are far apart, then you really need to condition on the exact configuration of the remaining pins rather than just how many there are. However, that is more complicated than we need to get into to illustrate the concepts of probability. It's also probably more detail about bowling than what you really want to hear. <laughs> But it's a valid point. Um, so this probability function of x2, it's what's known as a conditional probability function because the condition involves x1, what happens on the first roll of this frame of bowling. So it depends on x1. It's conditioned on what happens uh, in x1 because n for the second roll is 10 minus x1. And just as a mathematical detail for this, if you knock down all 10 pins on the first roll, you're considered to knock down zero on the second roll, even though the second roll doesn't actually happen in a game of bowling because you've already knocked down all 10 pins. You just go on to the next frame. But we'll call that 10 and an automatic zero. All right? So... Conditioning is a fundamental idea because ultimately what we want to work to is what's the probability of something you don't know conditional on whatever you do know. So specifying conditional probability functions is a really fundamental idea for Bayesianism. Uh, okay. Now, how would we obtain the joint? Uh, you probably can't see. Oh, you can't see this here. If you squint. Uh, how will we obtain the joint distribution, the probability of knocking down x1 pins on the first roll and x2 pins on the second roll, given that we start the frame with n equal 10 pins standing up. So this is a little bit harder. I'm gonna give you like eight seconds to think about this one. Give you a hint, it involves one of the rules. I'll give you another hint. It involves 
Well, we've only talked about two rules. It's a little bit different from the rain and the day of the week thing. Don't need a specific number, just need a general idea of the approach of how you would go about doing that. Okay, first person in. Uh, right, so can you say it in terms of X1 and X2? X1 is the number of pins knocked down in the first row, X2. Um, so you just take the probability of um, X1 times the probability of X2 given X1. Correct. And we just got through saying what the conditional probability is. And the first probability, otherwise known as the marginal probability, of knocking down X1 pins on the first roll is what we started off with. So we have two functions. We can multiply them together. That is going to tell us the probability of the bivariate event knocking down X1 pins on the first roll and X2 pins on the second roll. <clears throat> so this is math for what uh, she just said. We, we take the probability of knocking down X1, given that there's uh, 10 pins to start with, multiplied by the conditional probability of knocking down X2 pins on the second roll, given that we have knocked down X1 pins on the first roll. And that, again, is just gonna be a product of these Fibonacci ratios, again, multiplied by an indicator function that puts prob makes it be probability zero for knocking down any combination of pins that adds up to more than 10. And we can write some R code to represent that. So first I create an 11 by 11 matrix and put zeros in it. Uh, and then I'm gonna do a double loop. So I'm starting, I'm gonna loop uh, over all elements in omega, and I'm gonna call that X1. So here, I calculate the marginal probability of knocking down X1 pins on my first roll, and this is for all X1 in the set omega. And then in my inner loop, I'm gonna go from X2, starting at zero, up to the number 10 minus X1, and I'm gonna fill in the corresponding element of my table with the product of these two things. The product of knocking down, the probability of knocking down X1 pins on the first roll, multiplied by the conditional probability of knocking down X2 pins on the second roll, given that I knocked down X1 pins on my first roll. <clears throat> and that is going to fill up the uh, upper left part of the table, and when the loop are both finished, I can sum up over my whole 11 by 11 table, and it comes out to one, which is what's guaranteed if we follow the rules of probability uh, correctly. The, a bivariate probability distribution for two things that happen, again, you know, of the 66 things that could happen, in a frame of bowling, one of them has to happen. And so uh, the probability of the entire table added together comes out to exactly one. Okay? This might be a little bit easier if you squint at the table rather than the R code that generates the table, but you can run the R code on your own later. So here we have an 11 by 11 table. The interior cells tell us the probability of knocking down X1 pins on the first roll and X2 pins on the second roll. The rows uh, correspond to the first row and the columns correspond to the second row. So over in the right, you know, we have, let's say here, the probability of knocking down six pins on the first roll and nine pins on the second roll. What's that? 
Zero, okay, that was easy. What's the probability of knocking down four pins on the first roll and six pins on the second roll? Not quite zero. That it's actually 0.0008 or 0.008, something, okay? And as we just saw, if you sum up all these numbers, they come out to a sum of one. So something out of the 121 possibilities has to occur, but there's 55 that have a probability of exactly zero. So there's actually only 66 events that have a positive probability. All of these numbers are pretty small. Uh, so of the 66 things that could happen, each one of them has a small probability of actually happening. But if you add up all the small probabilities, you get exactly one. So does everyone understand what's being represented by this table here? These in the interior are the joint or the bivariate probability of knocking down, you know, whatever in the row is your first roll and whatever in the column as your second roll. You just take the intersection of the row and the column that tells you the probability of knocking down X1 pins on the first roll and X2 pins on the second roll in a coherent fashion. All right? Questions? All right. So what if I asked you, what is the probability of knocking down nine pins on the second roll, but I don't tell you what happened on the first roll. Going to give you five seconds to figure that out. Again, it involves one of the two rules. A specialization of one of the two rules that we started with. All right, so who could tell me what's the probability of knocking down nine pins on the second roll? Who besides Adam can tell me the probability of knocking down nine pins on the second roll? Steve. Uh, probability in both cases, both being what two? Zero and one on the first row. So the probability of... Okay, so we're talking ninth column. Right, so we're talking about the probability of knocking down nine pins on the second row, conditional on probability of knocking down zero pins on the first row, plus probability of knocking down nine pins in the second row. All right. Conditional probability of knocking down one pin in the first row. Yeah, okay, uh, that's almost right. So we know if, if you knock down nine pins on the second row, you have to be either knock down zero or one on the first roll. So all this, these are all exactly zero. That's impossible to get more than two on the first roll if you knock down nine on the uh, second roll. So in order to get the probability of knocking down nine pins on the second roll, if I don't tell you what happened on the first roll, we use the general addition rule. However, these two events are mutually exclusive. You can't knock down zero pins and one pin on the same roll, the first roll of a frame of bowling. So the third piece in the general addition roll, uh, rule is zero. So what? how do we construct the probability of two mutually exclusive events? What's the probability that one or the other happens? You add them together. So in this case, if you can see, it'd be like 0.00102 plus 0.00166, whatever that is. That's the probability of knocking down nine pins on the second roll. If I don't tell you what happened on the first roll, you just know that by process of elimination, it has to be zero or one, All right? That is what's known as the marginal probability of knocking down nine pins on the second roll. 
And the reason why it's called a marginal probability is back a long time ago, they used to write these things in the margins of uh, you know, tables, just like this. And so in general, how would we construct the probability of knocking down X two pins on the second roll if I don't tell you what happens on the first roll? Not looking for a specific number here. What's the general process that you would go through to figure out the probability of knocking down X two pins on the second roll if I don't tell you what happened on the first roll? Steve. Sum down the columns. And the reason why it's called a marginal probability is they would take the sums down the columns and they would write them at the margin on the bottom margin of the table. All right? So it's not evident here, but what would be the, how would you construct the marginal probability of knocking down X1 pins on the first roll from this table? Sum across the rows. In which case I could write the marginal probability of knocking down X1 pins in this margin of the table. So the interior tells you the, the joint probability of knocking down X1 pins on the first roll and X2 pins on the second roll. And in the lower margin or the right margin, you can write in the marginal probability of one roll in isolation of the other. Okay? So this is a very uh, also important concept. Uh, we talked just a minute ago how we can, can construct a bivariate probability by taking a marginal probability function and multiplying it by a conditional probability function. But if we have a bivariate probability function or more generally a joint probability function of two or more things, we can obtain the marginal probability of you know, any of those by accumulating, in this case, summing down the columns or by summing across the rows to obtain the probability of just one thing without regard to the other role in the frame of bullying. So we can construct a bivariate probability distribution by multiplying a marginal times a conditional, and we can deconstruct a joint probability table like this, at least in the discrete case, by summing away one of the, the events, yeah, either down the columns or across the rows, to get the probability of knocking down, let's say, X2 pins on the second roll, irrespective of what happens on the first roll. Got it? Okay, that's what I just said. Uh, or in more mathematical terms, of the marginal probability function, we take the joint probability function of knocking down X1 pins on the first roll, X2 pins on the second, and sum it over all elements of the sample space of the first roll of a frame of bowling. And we can write that joint probability function as the product of a marginal and a conditional. And just to check our work, we can uh, put up some R code. So uh, gluing these things together, the row sums of the table I had up previously, that's in the first row there. Uh, if we just evaluate the function uh, PR at all elements of omega, that's the middle row. And you can see that these numbers in the first two rows are exactly the same. They both, they have to both yield the same numbers because it's the probability, marginal probability of knocking down X1 out of 10 available pins. And then the probability, marginal probability of knocking down X2 pins on the second row is the sum down the columns of the, of the table on the previous slide. These numbers are different. 
So the probability of knocking down one pin on the second roll is different than the probability of knocking down one pin on the first roll. And why is that? Steve. Yeah, different numbers of pins are available to be knocked down. If you're a good bowler, the probability of knocking down one pin on your first roll is pretty small. However, if you're a good bowler, the probability of knocking down one pin on your second roll is, you know, like 0.176. That's because a lot of the time there's only one pin left available. Or maybe there's two pins and you, you know, you knock down one of them or whatever. So the marginal probability of the second roll different than the marginal probability of the first roll. Um, and that, you know, makes sense in the context of bowling. So uh, although I said there's only two uh, main important rules in probability, there's actually a third one, which is even more important than the previous two, but it's a pretty trivial implication of the general multiplication rule. And this is known as Bayes' rule. So because the probability of A and B can either be written as the probability of B times the conditional probability of A given B, or it can also equivalently be written as the probability of A multiplied by the conditional probability of B given A, I can just rearrange that. <clears throat> Oops. Come back. I can just, uh, you know, since these two things are equal to the same thing, I can just do some algebra. It's basically just one division and isolate the probability of A given B and express that as the marginal probability of A times the conditional probability of B given that A occurs divided by the marginal probability of B. And this is a valid expression, provided that the probability of B is at least a little bit greater than zero. So the reason why we have this uh, minor restriction, probability of B has to be greater than zero, it doesn't make sense to evaluate um, you know, the probability of A given that B has occurred if the probability of B is zero which is to say B is impossible. So this is, you know, uh, only for the case where both A and B are at least possible. And I want to know what's the probability of A given B. All I have to do is evaluate the three terms on the right hand side of this equation and it will tell me that answer. So that is very important. We could use it to answer a question such as, what's the probability of knocking down A equal three pins on your first roll, given that you knock down B equal four pins on your second roll? Now, chronologically, that's kind of a weird question to ask, but imagine you just walked into a bowling uh, alley and uh, you hear somebody say, I knocked down B equal four pins on my second roll, <laughs> but you don't know what happened on their first roll. You're uncertain. You didn't see that. So you need to come up with a probability distribution, a function that tells you the probability of knocking down A pins on your first roll, given the person told you that they knocked down B equal four pins on their second roll, you need to use Bayes' rule. How would you go about computing that conditional probability of knocking down three pins on the first roll, given that four pins were knocked down on the second roll? All right, 15 seconds to think about that. 
Okay, okay. Again, not looking for exact number here, but what would the process be by which you would figure out what this conditional probability is? Yeah. And how would you obtain the probability of four <laughs> on the second roll? Uh, yeah, so what you're trying to evaluate is the probability of knocking down three on the first row given that four on the second. So you only need to evaluate the denominator for the case B equals four. But how would you go about evaluating the denominator for the case that B is equal to four? And B was, B was four. right. So in the fifth column of the table, we would sum it down. That's the denominator. And then the numerator is just the cell in the uh, intersection of three and four. All right. So the number, I know you were very excited to figure out what this is. Uh, we would just take joint underscore PR, which was our 11 by 11 table evaluate it for three on the first and four on the second that's the numerator of Bayes rule and we would divide by the sum of the elements corresponding to knocking down four pins on the second roll and that number comes out to point oh three two two one six six eight approximately but more important than this number is the process by which we arrived at this conditional probability of what we don't know given what we do know. So the thing on the left-hand side is what we were after, and we needed the three pieces on the right-hand side in order to get there. So we started with a marginal probability of knocking down A pins on the first roll, and then we moved to the conditional probability of knocking down B pins on the second roll, given that we knocked down A pins on the first roll. Those two things together provide us the probability of knocking down A pins on the first roll and B pins on the second roll. And that comprises the numerator of Bayes' rule. We can also use the joint probability of knocking down A pins on the first roll and B pins on the second roll to get the denominator of Bayes' rule, the marginal probability of knocking down B pins on the second roll. And that's obtained from the joint probability by summing down the columns of that table corresponding to which column we want to evaluate for condition B if we know that condition B has held. And so another way of thinking about this, if you go back to the table, well, you know that, what did I say, four pins were knocked down on the second roll. So this whole table, we know it sums up to one over all 66 things that could happen in two rolls of a frame of bullet. But if someone who is honest tells you that they knocked down four pins on the second roll, we know like none of this matters because it didn't happen and none of that matters because that didn't happen either. The only things that could have happened were these seven things here. And so we have to adjust our probabilities to condition on the fact that four pins were knocked down on the second roll. So we've got, you know, what I say, three and four. This element here, that's the probability of both three on the first roll and four on the second, divided by the sum of all this, which is in the denominator of Bayes' rule. So we get some number that's 
this sum is going to be less than one. So we're dividing a small number by something that's less than one. It's going to be a somewhat bigger number. In this case, it's 0 0.03221668. All right. So this base rule, as you might suspect, is the cornerstone of Bayesianism. And ironically, even frequentists would accept this use of Bayes' rule in the bowling case. If these probability of knocking down this or that number of pins was derived by observing an approximately infinite number of frames of bowling for like the same person and calculating the proportion of times that three pins were knocked down or four pins or whatever. In other words, this table was uh, you know, generated by looking at long run frequency. So bowl over and over and over again, an infinite number of times, and you can evaluate the proportion that each of these 55 things occur, and that tells you the probabilities. So even frequentists accept Bayes' rule, they just don't ex accept Bayesianism, uh, because Bayesians generalize the scope of Bayes' rule to take A to be your beliefs about whatever you don't know, and they take B to be whatever data that you actually have in your hands and you know has happened, <clears throat> and you know plug those in to the right-hand side of Bayes' rule to give you the probability distribution for whatever you don't know, conditional on whatever you do know. And frequentists don't uh, uh, go along with this extension of the scope of Bayes' rule uh, because they say probabilities are not subjective beliefs, states of the mind. They are properties of objects and we observe those probabilities by doing an infinite number of replications and calculating the proportion of times that this or that happens. So what really makes uh, the great disagreement between frequentists and Bayesians is whether Bayesians should be allowed to use uh, you know, the, the vocabulary of probability and the mathematical uh, properties of probability theory to describe their subjective beliefs about things they don't know. Um, we're going to do that in this class. So uh, in that sort of generalization, <clears throat> the probability of A, where A is, you know, whatever you don't know, this is known as the prior probability. It's the probability that you would put on all the things that A could be before you observe any new data. So like whatever probability you would uh, ascribe to, you know, what's the probability it's going to be greater than 50 degrees tomorrow. You know, whatever you think that's today. And then B sort of represents data. So you have, you know, whatever you believe now, and that is represented by a marginal probability distribution on A. Then you collect new data, like you watch, or nobody watches the news anymore. You open up your weather app, and it tells you data, like you know, it's projection to be like 53 degrees for the high temperature tomorrow. So you then evaluate what's the probability of observing these data in your weather app, given your beliefs, you know, going into it. That probably seems, uh, you know, pretty plausible. But just because your weather app tells you it's going to be 53 degrees tomorrow, it doesn't mean it's going to be. It could be more or less or whatever. Uh, so it's still an uncertain event today as to whether the probability uh, or whether the temperature will be greater than 50 degrees tomorrow. And so we could use Bayes' rule uh, you know, marginalizing out the, uh, the numerator to get the denominator, dividing by the numerator, uh, by the denominator to get the probability of A given B, namely what's the probability that the temperature is going to be greater than 50 degrees given 
that your weather app tells you its forecast for tomorrow is for a high of 53 degrees. And so that should probably be a pretty high probability, but it's not going to be one. It's not guaranteed, but you can reallocate your probability over the sample space for the thing that you don't know when you observe new factual data. So if you didn't look at your weather app, you would have your prior probability distribution on the temperature tomorrow being greater than 50 degrees. But you want to update your beliefs in light of the data that you see from your weather app. And that general process is what we're going to use over and over and over again over the course of the semester in order to get updated beliefs about things that we don't know in the social sciences, given what we do know, that being the data that we collect. OK? Yes? Was the idea of updating what distinguishes the Bayesian from the constrictors is that they never apply visual as like an update to their beliefs from like a prior probability of the interior? Uh, right. But I think it's a bit more fundamental than that. Frequentism rules out the possibility of using probability to describe a state of mind. So Bayesians say, okay, probability does describe a state of mind, and I'm going to update my state of mind every time I see new data. But it's really frequentists are objecting to the first part of taking probability to be personal and subjective rather than a property of dice or you know, no, they they're saying probability can only be used to describe the long run frequency of events. Like if we were to spin the roulette wheel over and over and over again, you could use that to say what's the probability that a roulette wheel comes up on 37 or black or red or whatever. If probabilities are derived that way, frequentists are okay with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but Bayesians want to apply this much more generally to situations that we can't repeat over and over and over again, like the Super Bowl that's coming up in three weeks or whatever. You know, you all have probability distribution over, you know, what's the probability that the four remaining teams will win this year's Super Bowl. But they're not going to play the Super Bowl over and over and over and over and over again for you to get those long run probabilities. You have to go on what data you've observed in the season so far on like, you know, what players and teams and stuff are doing good in order to arrive at this conditional probability that the Packers will win the Super Bowl or something like that. Yes. Tuesday, you said that one of the downsides of Bayesian inference is that it's more useful for convincing yourself and for convincing others. Is that because your priors may be different from the person you're trying to convince? Exactly. And so I guess the solution to that is just generalize the priors? Or, or Perhaps. Or I mean, one thing you can do is tell someone what they should believe given their priors you can inform them of that and I'm sure they'll appreciate it. Um, <laughs> but the other thing that I said is the real problem is not so much that people come in with different prior beliefs that totally happens, but a lot of people refuse to update their beliefs in accordance with Bayes rule. So they see, you know, data on how well the Packers have played over the second half of the season, but they don't update their beliefs enough. So if you ask someone in Boston, like, what's the probability the Patriots are going to win the Super Bowl? And they'll tell you, like, 12. Like, that's really the real problem. Not that, you know, people in Boston have different beliefs than, like, regular people. Okay? Yes? Just to clarify, can you, like, you're saying that Bayesian inference is different from the Bayesian inference? Yes. So if you observe an infinite number of roll frames of bowling by the same person and you came up with this table, then mathematically you can plug in the three things 
and get the conditional probability of knocking down three on the first roll, given that you knock down four on the first on the second roll. It just follows out by doing a little bit of algebra. What is they would not uh, approve of is if you you know walk into you know a bowling and then you have subjective beliefs about how good this bowler is going to do without having observed an infinite number of replications. So if you just see somebody who's like drunk and trying to bowl, you know, you would say they have like a low probability of doing, you know, well or whatever, but that's your sort of subjective belief, not something you observed by watching a drunk person bowl an infinite number of frames. So like a frequency tool, like essentially having a tool to certain situations that basically cannot provide. Yes. And moreover, they will complain a lot when you use your tools to do exactly that. Yes? So when we're doing, so the Fibonacci thing is what's giving us the distribution of a good bowler. In so, this case, yeah. So Bayes is saying there's another distribution out there for drunk bowlers that we would be substituting. You could, yeah. Next. So it, it would be a different function that you start with, but you would still apply Bayes' rule. So there's a marginal of A, a conditional of B given A. There's a denominator that you get by summing down the columns. Plug in those three things, you get the thing on the left. That's the same. What probabilities you use, how you come up with those, that's a personal thing. Yes? So how mutually exclusive is the concept of probability under frequency and expectations? It sounds like the basing idea is kind of informed by empirical observations. Yeah. Uh, I would say they're they're pretty uh, impossible to reconcile, except that if you observe an, if you're Bayesian and you observe an infinite amount of data and you apply Bayes' rule, you're going to land at the same place the frequent test did. Yeah. Adam. I was going to give you an example: is that a frequent test when presented with a coin flipped a million times in a row that comes up heads, asked what the probability that it's going to be heads the next time, says one fifth. Bayesian says there's no way that's a perfect pair coin. Uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Uh huh. Sorry if I uh, just missed this, but um, I, I'm so confused about whether, like, is the frequency objection to this type of inference that it is like bad and wrong, or is it that it is using the language of power frequency probability in a way that's not accurate? And it's, on top. it's the second. But it is. No, it mathematically it's the same logic, the same implications. It's the scope of what you. I mean, frequent is it's like saying you can't use French to describe the moon, like that's a perversion of of French or the moon or something. <laughs> but I don't know French, but they probably have words for like craters and stuff like that. So I mean, you could do it if it's useful, uh, but you know they're saying you can't or you shouldn't. Okay, so the algebra of all that is a little bit tedious. And like I said, the bowling thing is actually on the easy side. Uh, these days, it's easier to do simulations with random numbers. And oftentimes, we have to do this uh, in situations where the math is just completely intractable. So one thing we can easily do in R is simulate 10 to the 7, which is 10 million, uh, rolls of uh, the first a uh, first roll of a frame of bowling so we'll sample from the sample space omega <clears throat> uh, we'll do it with replacement equal true so these are independent frames and we're going to use the probability by evaluating our probability function for each element of omega so now i've you know literally not literally but figuratively done uh the first roll of 10 million frames of bowling and then I can do roll two. This is a little bit more complicated, but basically I'm just sampling from the set omega, one for each of the 10 million first rolls that I did. And now my probability is the conditional probability of knocking down, you know, whatever it is, given that there's 10 minus X1 remaining. So those two things together give me 10 million simulated complete rolls, uh, complete frames, of bowling, and then I can calculate the proportion of times that this or that thing happens on roll one among 
the uh, realizations where roll two is four. And this comes out, again, these numbers, anything higher than six is impossible if two, if four were knocked down on the second roll. And again, we see the same 0.0322 business that we got before analytically by applying base rule in the Fibonacci business uh, versus this thing where we just sort of calculated the same thing, but with brute computational force. So a hundred years ago, when they didn't have computers or cell phones, um, having analytical solutions to these sorts of things was paramount because this is the only way you were gonna get anything done. These days, uh, it was a lot faster, you know, for me to write this down and to evaluate it than to make that whole 11 by 11 table and, you know, do the operations and stuff on it. And, you know, even though this is technically not exactly accurate because 10 million is a finite number, uh, this way of proceeding with random number simulation gives me way more accuracy than any person really needs in order to understand like the probability of this or that happening on polling. So 0.0322 is not quite 0.0322 but I really don't care about the 1668 or any of the twos. So 0.03 is really close enough uh, for any sort of social science purpose. So oftentimes these days we go straight to random number simulation because either we're lazy and we want to just put human work onto the computer and make the computer work because that's what a computer is good at doing. Or the math is actually impossible for us as humans to do. Nevertheless, if you generate numbers with the right probability, you can do this sort of thing on your computer to get approximate, but close enough for all relevant purposes, probabilities of what you don't know, given what you do know, which is really the goal of the use of uh, Bayes' rule for social science. Okay, so that is all for today. We're going to start on uh, next week um, with continuous random variables and also talk about expectations and stuff like that.